Okay. I'm going to talk about internet scale consensus. This is joint work with uh, Ido Bentov and Rafael Pass. Okay, some of you may remember that in August last year, uh, Delta Airlines had uh, one day of complete outage. You couldn't book flights, all the flights were canceled, and this turned out to be um, a failure of their uh, computing infrastructure. Something similar happened to the National Science Foundation. Uh, if you were trying to submit a proposal back in July, uh, sorry, you had to wait. Um, okay, so I wouldn't be too upset if I'm, um, you, you tell me I cannot fly. And if you tell me I cannot do science, uh, I reassure you I'll be very cranky. Okay, the moral of the story is that we need uh, two things, replication and robustness. Okay, so this is a very simple idea, but it is precisely this very simple idea that gave birth uh, to an entire research area uh, called distributed systems. And there has been uh, 30 years of wonderful research and, and development in this area. Okay, so in distributed systems, we care about a very important abstraction called uh, state machine replication. And this is also known as a linearly ordered lock or consensus. So what's state machine replication? Uh, let's consider a typical scenario. Uh, suppose we have Google. Google Wallet is a mission-critical application. Uh, and suppose they want to replicate their servers. Uh, this has to be an, a good idea, because if you put your money in Google Wallet, you don't want to lose the money if the server goes down. OK. Um, so now imagine all of these servers, they want to agree on a linearly ordered log of transactions. And there are two important security properties that we care about, uh, consistency and liveness. Uh, consistency says that the honest nodes must agree on what the log is. And liveness says that um, if a client uh, submits a transaction, then this transaction should appear in all of the server's logs uh, very quickly. OK. Um, so th th this might be deceptively simple. You, know, you may think this is a very simple problem. Uh, indeed. The problem is somewhat trivial if all these servers are honest and uh, fo uh, correctly following the protocol. Uh, but the issue is that if some of these servers are compromised, and compromised servers, for instance, can be um, behaving arbitrarily, then it turns out the, the problem is very much non-trivial. OK. And when we, uh, traditionally, when we think about consensus, and this is what I talked about is kind of the typical scenario that we think about. And the deployment is typically within a single organization. We have a relatively speaking small scale deployment. And the nodes are interconnected with fast uh, local area network. Uh, and because these nodes belong to the same organization, we assume that they're mutually trustful. OK. Um, and then in the year one after Bitcoin, there was Genesis. And this kind of this was really exciting development because it opened a new chapter for distributed consensus. And, and it's amazing because now we can do internet scale consensus. And um, internet scale consensus obviously raises new challenges. So uh, for instance, on the internet, you know, we may have thousands and millions of nodes. Uh, the nodes may sometimes have uh, bad network connections. And some nodes may have outages. And so there's a lot more unpredictability. Uh, and also, you know, on the internet, everyone's kind of acting selfishly, so we assume that the nodes are mutually distrustful. Uh, and all of these raise new challenges. Uh, I talk uh, quite frequently with people in the cryptocurrency community, and it seems like everyone kind of um, believes that uh, these classical consensus protocols aren't a great fit for this internet scale deployment. And the reason being that they are not, quote unquote, robust enough. So, so this intuition may seem very, very nice, but it's, on the other hand, it's also somewhat um, unsatisfying because, for instance, it doesn't tell us um, exactly what robustness means. What new robustness properties are we looking for for internet scale deployment? And only when we can, only when we can answer this question uh, can we proceed to um, address the later questions such as, you know, why aren't traditional protocols robust enough and how can we actually achieve robustness? Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to, um, try to answer these questions, uh, maybe at least give a partial answer to these questions. And, oh, 
And before that, I wanted to say, um, you know, I actually I asked the various people in the cryptocurrency community what they mean by robustness, but it turns out that um, the community doesn't actually have a clear way of articulating what kind of properties they're looking for. Uh, and interestingly, like in this cryptocurrency community, uh, what, what this interesting phenomenon is that uh, the uh, scientific understanding kind of is lagging behind the empirical success. Uh, and this reminds me of this uh, interesting uh, thing that my, my colleague, uh, Amin Gonsira, he, he used to say, uh, you know, in, in the systems research community, uh, a very frequent question you'd ask uh, other researchers is, what's the time from your research paper to real-world deployment? Okay, so for, for classical technologies, like you'd expect an answer, um, let's say, with, um, between five years to ten years, um, before something like cryptocurrency, like in this area, the answer to this question is negative six months. Okay, uh, so let's begin with the most basic question, what is robustness? Uh, I, I'm going to make an analogy. Uh, we just had uh, our presidential, uh, presidential election. Uh, what happens when you ask uh, 300 million people to vote? Okay, so what's going to happen is that only 160 million of them will show up. And so what we can hope for is that, you know, perhaps among the people who actually do show up, maybe we can hope that 51% of them are honest. Because otherwise we cannot really predict the outcome of the election. Um, and we can kind of think of uh, consensus in you know, very much the same way, and I'm going to call this the sleepy model of consensus, uh, and we are going to assume that the nodes um, are either sleeping, uh, which means that they're offline, or they're awake, which means that they're online and actively participating in the protocol. So sleepy, for instance, can be a result of a um, bad network connection, maybe the nodes have temporary outages, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, importantly, the state status of each node can change. Like, maybe a node is an, uh, has an outage, but later it recovers from the outage. When the prince kisses uh, Snow White, she wakes up and she continues to participate in the protocol uh, very robustly. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to make uh, a couple other assumptions. Uh, the first two are pretty standard. The malicious nodes can behave arbitrarily. Uh, and in particular, our adversary, uh, like Dan, uh, can be very, very smart, and you know, he can deviate uh, from the protocol in very smart ways, uh, perhaps to like, diverge the opinions of the honest nodes. Okay, and the adversary is allowed to um, delay and reorder messages arbitrarily, uh, but on the other hand, we are also going to assume that um, the nodes who actually uh, are online, they, have, um, they can receive messages uh, relatively quickly, uh, they may receive messages out of order, but they are going to receive them relatively quickly because if not, we are just going to treat these nodes as being offline. Okay. So a very natural question we may want to ask in this setting is, can we um, achieve consensus assuming that among the people who actually show up, 51% of them um, are honest? Okay. <coughs> so before... Um, telling you the answer to this question, I wanted to say this is actually the best you can hope for because we actually have a lower bound showing that if among the people who show up only like less than 50% are honest, then you cannot hope to reach consensus. I'm not going to explain this lower bound. Um, and uh, also here are some, um, some things that I actually mean when I ask this question. So we are going to assume that the protocol cannot anticipate how many people are going to show up. Uh, it could be like maybe 30% will show up, it could be 1% will show up. Uh, maybe I anticipate that 30% will show up, but in the end only 1% showed up, and I want it to be the case that the people, the 99% of people who didn't show up, they should not hamper the progress of the people who actually um, do show up. Okay, so also maybe in the beginning, um, a lot of nodes are sleeping, but maybe later they, they wake up, and at the moment they wake up, they are going to receive all the pending messages, and we want to say that for those nodes that wake up, they are going to make um, progress and you know, start to agree with the rest of the network. Okay. So you'd think like this is a very, very natural question, and with 30 years of research on distributed systems, we would have answered this question by now. But the answer actually may surprise you because it turns out that all classical protocols break down in this model. Um, we can actually e even say something, uh, something stronger because even when we are willing to assume that among the people who show up, 99% of them are honest, 
And this is still not enough because even, even when 99% of them are honest, we still cannot, uh, none of the classical protocols will actually work. Okay, so this seems like a very strong claim that I'm making. I'm going to explain um, very quickly um, why this is the case. Uh, it turns out that for classical consensus protocols, um, roughly speaking, uh, there are two broad classes, uh, synchronous protocols and asynchronous protocols. In the synchronous model, we typically assume that the messages sent will be delivered immediately. Whereas in the asynchronous model, um, the adversary can delay and reorder messages arbitrarily, and the delay can be indefinite and unknown to the protocol um, upfront. So we know a lot about both models, and there have been uh, many protocols proposed in the past that solve the consensus protocol, uh, solve the consensus problem uh, in these settings. So I, I just have to convince you why and each class of protocols uh, do not work, it's relatively easy to see why synchronous protocols fail because uh, in our model, remember, we allow nodes to go to sleep, and when they wake up, they are going to receive the pending messages. So this is a way for, for you to break the synchrony assumption. Basically, messages are not necessarily received immediately, and obviously, in such a model, all, all of the synchronous protocols uh, don't work. Um, and perhaps it's a more interesting question to ask why the, even the asynchronous, a, asynchronous protocols don't work. Okay, so here, in the classical asynchronous model, if a node goes to sleep, we are going to pessimistically treat it as being corrupt. So imagine you have an asynchronous protocol that can tolerate, uh, let's say, up to one-third corruptions. Okay, what's going to happen is, let's say it turns out only 1% of people showed up. And in this case, the protocol is going to treat like 99% of the nodes as being corrupt. And what's going to happen is like the, the nodes are going to kind of wait to collect, let's say, uh, collect votes from two thirds of the people. But in this case, only 1% of the people showed up. So you're never going to collect enough mo votes and therefore the protocol gets stuck. Okay, so the, the fundamental problem here is that uh, as I said, we cannot anticipate how many people are going to show up. Okay, so I've kind of talk, talked about uh, what I mean by robustness and why classical protocols fail. Uh, I, I wanted to make a remark, you know, I've only talked about really one aspect of robustness. And robustness can mean many other things, like for instance, one particularly interest uh, aspect is incentive compatibility. This is something that is very, very important in the internet scale deployment, but perhaps of less concern if, you know, in this classical setting where you have a single organization. Um, but, but this can be a, to a topic for a separate talk. We also have other uh, works such as the fruit chain paper that uh, addresses uh, the incentive compatibility issue. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, we are going to kind of focus on how to address the sleepiness issue. Uh, so I'm going to tell you how we can design provably secure protocols that give you robustness. Okay, and how do we do this? Uh, let's turn back to the people and hear what the, the people have to say. You know, the, the community, the people tell us that um, Bitcoin's Nakamoto blockchain protocol is um, exceptionally robust. Okay, and in fact, it's actually quite amazing if you think about it because the Bitcoin protocol has been up and running uh, pretty much without interruption for the past eight years. And, and for this reason, uh, people refer to Bitcoin as the honey badger of money. And honey badger, as we all know, is a very robust uh, animal. Okay. And in fact, the people are right, because we can actually formally prove that the Nakamoto blockchain protocol does give you a consensus in the sleepy model. And in fact, our paper kind of implies this. I'm not going to explain why. And so that's good. But the biggest drawback of Bitcoin, as we all know, is that it's enormously wasteful. The electricity consumed by Bitcoin is greater than uh, the largest nuclear plant in the United States, which is more than 10% of all of the solar power in the United States. Okay, so therefore we want to ask the following question. Can we uh, achieve the robustness properties of Nakamoto consensus, but you know, not have to pay the expensive uh, proof of work? How can we do this? Well, well, let's first try the most natural idea, right? Let's take Nakamoto's blockchain and maybe try to just remove the proof of work. Um, and, but really the challenge here is how you can do this in a way that doesn't break security. Okay, I'm going to explain how to do this, but um, 
in order to tell you how to do this, I'm going to first explain how Nakamoto blockchain works. Uh, and I'm going to do this uh, relatively quickly because maybe many of you are already very familiar with Nakamoto blockchain. What is the blockchain? It's a chain of blocks. Um, and how do we build a blockchain? Uh, imagine we have this chain uh, and we want to extend the next block. So what do we do? We take a bunch of transactions that we want to confirm. So maybe one of the transactions is that Dan wants to pay Elaine 50 bitcoins, uh, maybe to purchase Elaine's car. Okay. I'm going to take a hash function and I'm going to hash the following things. Uh, this blue guy is the previous block that I want to extend. And I'm going to take the, the transactions I want to confirm and also a puzzle solution. I'm going to hash all of these things together. And if the outcome is less than a difficulty parameter D, then I say that I have found um, a solution. Okay, so the screen guy is called the puzzle solution. <clears throat> and whenever I find a puzzle solution, I'm able to mine the next block. Okay, uh, one reason why Bitcoin is computationally expensive is um, because we assume that the, let's, say, let's assume the hash function is a random oracle. Um, and in order for me to uh, find a solution, I have to try many different um, uh, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle until you know, I can find one that uh, satisfies this inequality. Okay. Um, it's very important that the honest nodes are going to believe in the longest chain if you see multiple forks. Uh, and the reason being that imagine then our adversary, uh, he purchases the car from, from Elaine, he receives the car and now he wants to erase this transaction so he can uh, double spend his money. And how does Dan do this? Uh, he can basically mine a longer chain than the main chain. Um, but the intuition is that if the transaction is buried deep enough in the blockchain, then Dan cannot successfully mine a longer chain unless he has the majority of the hash power. And this intu intuition has been formalized in uh, some earlier works, for, for example, the uh, very elegant work of Gray, Gray et al. and also uh, Pass et al. Okay. Um, so now we know how the Nakamoto blockchain works and let's try to remove the, the proof of work. Okay, so one thing that we um, observe is that we can think of the Nakamoto blockchain as performing leader election. Whenever you successfully find the uh, puzzle solution, you are the next leader and you get to propose the next batch of, batch of transactions. Okay, uh, and our key idea here is that we want to restrict the puzzle space. So in, in Bitcoin's uh, Nakamoto blockchain, uh, the nodes have to try many different puzzle solutions, but what if, let's say, you know, that there aren't so many puzzle solutions to try, and then you don't have to work so hard. Okay, and so for the time being, for simplicity, let's consider a permission setting, meaning that we know exactly which nodes are participating in the protocol, and every node uh, knows the public keys of every other node. And uh, later in the talk, I'm going to remark how to take this permission protocol and make it permissionless by doing proof of stake. Okay. So remember that this was our Nakamoto blockchain. Uh, people have to work very hard, but let's restrict the puzzle space. Uh, how, how do we do this? Um, imagine the nodes are weakly synchronized. Everyone has like a weakly synchronized, uh, uh, I mean, they have a weakly synchronized clock. Okay, let's, um, let's say now in every time step, and Dan is going to um, hash his name, uh, concatenated uh, with the current time. And if the outcome is less than the difficulty parameter, Dan is elected the leader in this round, in this time step. And if he is the leader, he can um, take the block he wants to extend. He can take a batch of transactions. He can uh, also take the current time step and he's going to sign all of these um, uh, things. And this allows him to mine the next block and everyone can verify you know, that the block is correctly formed by checking that Dan is indeed the leader in this time step and that the block is correctly signed by Dan's public key. Okay, so this seems like a very natural idea, but, but the question is whether this protocol is secure. Okay, well, it turns out the answer is no, the, this protocol actually, it doesn't work. And, and fundamentally, because the adversary can, um, ha has a lot of advantage in comparison with the honest nodes. Like for instance, when the honest nodes get elected, he's going to sign exactly one block, but when the adversary gets elected, he can sign many blocks. 
Uh, and also the, the honest nodes are only going to mine in the present. They are going to take the current time step and try to hash it, whereas the adversary can pick future time steps and hash you know, as many times as he wants. Okay, so in order to make the protocol secure, we have to um, kind of constrain uh, the ways in which the adversary can behave. Uh, and here, here are a couple ideas. Let's, let's say um, the time stamps in the blocks have to strictly increase. And let's also require that the honest nodes will reject any blockchain uh, where the block has a future timestamp. So if we do this, then you can see, you know, when the adversary gets elected, he's not able to sign many blocks because the timestamps have to strictly increase. And also the adversary can't just take a future time, um, time step and try to hash it. Okay, so the, now the question is, is this um, fixed protocol now secure? Okay. Well, it turns out that this is kind of like a trick question because the answer is yes, it is indeed secure, but it's non-trivial to see this. Uh, and what's most non-trivial, I, I won't have time to explain the details here, uh, but essentially uh, in, in this protocol, there are ways that the adversary can attack the system that was previously not possible in the Nakamoto blockchain. And therefore, because of this reason, the previous Nakamoto and blockchain analysis, and they failed to work. Okay, and therefore, in order for us to prove this protocol secure, we have to do much more work. Uh, I, I won't have time to cover the proof. Uh, if you are interested, you can read our paper. Uh, we actually are going to release a new version pretty soon. Uh, and in, in the paper, we also have some additional results, like we can weaken the assumption by removing the random oracle, and we can achieve adaptive security through complexity leveraging. Uh, well, it turns out that in this case, even complexity leveraging is non-trivial. Um, I, I, I won't um, go into more details. Um, I, I wanted to say, so our protocol is called Sleepy Consensus. Uh, I wanted to say that um, I think one particularly attractive application of uh, Sleepy Consensus in, is for a consortium blockchain. Uh, what is a consortium blockchain? This is something that the banks really want. Like they want to have a distributed ledger uh, and maybe each bank will contribute some consensus nodes and, and this will allow them to do much faster interbank settlement. Okay, and there are a bunch of projects and companies in the cryptocurrency space that are trying to help the banks uh, build a consortium blockchain. Um, what's nice about Sleepy in the setting is that because of our ability to deal with the sleepiness, you get some of these properties kind of for free. Like you, it's very easy to reconfigure the system. It's very easy to recover from faults. And also in, in the uh, consortium blockchain setting, the, administ uh, the banks will have to administer their nodes uh, in a decentralized fashion. Like it will be really nice if um, let's say I'm a bank and I can kind of spawn some replicas and maybe reboot my machines without having to coordinate with other banks. So this protocol will allow you to do that. Okay, if you are interested in deploying our protocol, like we'll be very happy to talk to you guys. Uh, okay, so to quickly uh, summarize, I've talked about how to take uh, the Nakamoto blockchain protocol and how to remove the proof of work in a secure way such that we get uh, an instance of permission consensus. And um, I think what's interesting is that we can achieve um, these new robust properties that, that was uh, not possible with these classical consensus protocols. Okay, but it would also be nice, like I said, to have a permissionless protocol as well. Um, and in fact, we can do this, we can take Sleepy and, and recast it to the permissionless setting by doing proof of stake. Uh, so at a very, very high level, you know, in proof of work, uh, the, rough idea is that your voting power is proportional to uh, your computational power, but whereas in, in proof of stake, uh, your voting power is roughly speaking proportional to your stake in the system. Okay. So we also have a paper on um, the proof of stake protocol, it's called Snow White, uh, and the, the paper is up on ePrint, and we are also going to release a new version uh, pretty soon. Okay. Uh, so to conclude, we've come a really long way. We, we've, you know, we started with uh, distributed consensus, but with relatively scale, uh, small scale deployment. But now we are in this uh, internet scale uh, distributed systems. Uh, you know, on the internet, no one knows you are a Pokemon. Uh, these are pictures taken from uh, a boot camp hosted by uh, our cryptocurrency center called IC3. Okay, uh, well, IC3 has very colorful activities. That's why you should become our partner. Uh, and also, we must not forget that Dan is our very, very smart adversary. And if your protocol isn't provably secure, he surely will find a vulnerability and earn all the Bitcoins for himself. Okay, uh, so to conclude, um, 
in internet scale distributed systems very exciting. You know, Bitcoin is really just a gl glimpse into our future. And there were, uh, like, through the process of working on this, like, we realized that there are a lot more questions that we don't understand than, than the ones that we understand. So we need um, new theoretical frameworks to kind of uh, analyze and reason about these protocols, and we also need provably secure uh, protocol design and implementations. And this area should be of particular interest to the real-world crypto uh, audience, because this is where, like, crypto can make a real world impact like the community is actually hungry for uh, these you know modern fancy crypto protocols that may like for instance involve zero knowledge proofs and multi-party computation uh, and remember what i said uh, in this area the time from your research paper to deployment is negative six months so you don't have to worry about you know it takes a long time for your research to make real world impact thank you very much Right, so we do have time for questions, uh, at least two questions. So, okay. Um, Sarah. Okay, um, can I just ask quickly, so you said that your fix involves timestamping stuff and basically saying that people don't accept timestamps in the future, but how does, can you just give a hint of how that works in a fully asynchronous setting? Because surely people would disagree about when the future is. And so the synchrony, there are two notions of synchrony. One is clock synchrony and the other is network synchrony. So in this case, we are assuming that the clock the clocks are weakly synchronized. So like your clock is relatively close to mine. Like in, in the first day, there was a very nice talk on uh, NTP security. So, so for instance, you know, clock synchrony can be achieved through things like NTP protocols. Hi, thanks. Nice talk. So um, in, you showed the original in the Nakamoto chain, you have the hash function of the last block and the coins and the puzzle solution. And in your system, you just have a hash of your name and the time. Mm -hmm. So why don't you include the last block in that hash as well? And that will actually um, give the adversary more advantage because the adversary can, uh, like let's say the adversary um, somehow controls the last block, right? And he can try many different contents of the last block and now he can try many different things. Mm. So, so you, you wouldn't be able to prove the protocol secure if you do that. Okay, thanks. Very nice talk. I'm wondering how does this compare in terms of number of transactions you can get to saying like, like there are certain distributed uh, transaction systems out there. How does it compare in performance, which is usually what people talk about when they talk about scale? That's a very good question. So we, we actually, we do have an implementation and we are in the process of like running evaluations. Um, so what I can say is that like for these classical Byzantine fault tolerance protocols like PBFT, typically um, you have like quadratic metadata overhead because everyone has to send every, everyone else like some metadata in, in the protocol, but here like everything is linear. So I think it really depends on whether your system is network bound or um, uh, whether the, the system is uh, um, network bound. If the system like is bandwidth bound, let's say, then potentially this protocol can, can be nice, but if it's kind of latency bound, um, and then P PBFT, like, like if you don't saturate your network bandwidth, then like in the optimistic case, like you only need like constant number of runs. Um, but here, maybe you need to wait for a few more blocks to, to get uh, confirmation. Yes. Uh, excellent talk. So uh, just one quick question. So, uh, so in your model, basically you can tolerate like most of the honest nodes just uh, in sleep node. But the thing that if you, in this mode, how you guarantee that honest nodes always have the connection with other honest nodes? And so, so that, that's a very good question. And essentially like we have this, um, like in this model, if you have a relatively fast network and you can receive messages within like some parameter delta delay, that then you are, you are considered as uh, being online. However, however, like if you temporarily, let's say you suffer from a network, uh, bad network connection and your messages are being delayed for a long time, at, at this moment we are going to treat you as sleepy. And so the, we basically, it's kind of, in order for the model to make sense, there has to be this, this um, cutoff delta that we pick and then, then you can say, okay, if you can receive messages and, you know, fast, where fast is relative to delta, then, then we, can't, we treat you as uh, uh, being online. Thank you. 
Okay, so let's thank uh, Lane again.